Thanks very much, Ben. And uh, what a fascinating history uh, you've uncovered there. That's great. Of course, the story of how the Chinese Communist Party was founded in secret by just a handful of people and then and has now grown into an organization of some 95 million members is truly remarkable. The story of China's transformation from the sick man of Asia into the world's second largest economy goes together with that of the CPC because the party provided the political architecture that made this development possible. Taking stock at 100 years means looking not only at China's achievements, but also at what this has meant and means for the world. The CPC story is one full of twists and turns, of tenacity against adversity, retreating when retreat was necessary, but also daring to seize the time when the opportunity arose. What has given the CPC its strength, its courage to face reality, to learn from mistakes, was and is Marxism. For the Chinese Communist Party, Marxism is not a dogma, but a set of tools applied concretely to solve China's problems. The key to the success of the revolution in 1949 lay mainly in the party's ability to mobilize the people effectively around both national and, social and class goals. For this, it drew on Marxist class analysis to devise a revolutionary strategy of shared benefit so as to unite all who could be united in the common goals of ending foreign domination and building the nation. Fundamental here was land reform, which gained the CPC the support of hundreds of millions of peasants. They participated in its mass organizations, they joined the party itself, they carried out and conformed with its policies, and they gave material support in paying taxes and enlist enlisting in its armies. China's contribution to the defeat of worldwide fascism in 1949 is often overlooked in the West. It was communist resistance together with the nationalist armies that kept Japanese troops bogged down in China so that the Soviets could concentrate all their forces against the Nazis on the Western Front. This cost up to 20 million Chinese lives. Nor is it widely understood that China was the first country to end colonial rule as the allies agreed in 1943 to give up the unequal treaties. China was to be one of the founding members of the United Nations and the CPC was present at that occasion. The example of how the Chinese people led by the Communist Party gained liberation in 1949 shone a bright light for colonized people around the world. Its experience of people's war, revolution, and the transformation of rural society was to be the inspiration for many national liberation movements in many different countries in the years to come. After 1949, the stabilization of the country within a couple of years was truly remarkable, given the century of turmoil and war that had gone before. China could now begin to focus on its development. It was far less developed than the Soviet Union had been at the start, but the party had the support of the peasants, the overwhelming majority of the population. This made possible an agricultural strategy of cooperation before mechanization. And in 1956, striking while the iron was hot, Mao led China into the socialist era. Through collective effort, the country greatly expanded its irrigation systems, undertook major infra infrastructural projects, for example, the building of the bridge over the Yangtze, which brought the north and the south of the country together in, in Nanjing. Um, it developed the foundations of heavy industry and rural industrialization was vital in maintaining the support of the peasants while the organization of health and welfare in the commune system was designed to make sure no one was left behind. Certainly there were terrible and tragic losses in the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, but economic growth in the Mao area on average at some 5% a year was above that of other developing countries. The biggest mistake that Mao made in my view was the failure to take po population control seriously from the 1950s. Life expectancy went up, the birth rate shot up, placing a huge strain on the economy. External circumstances were extremely hostile. The Korean and the Vietnam Wars fought on China's borders. The eventual split from the Soviet Union leaving China vulnerable. The Cold War all but eradicated China 
from Western consciousness. In, and in my school years, China was never mentioned. It just didn't exist. Yet a great deal was achieved for the world at that time, as Zhou Enlai and Nehru agreed the five principles of peaceful coexistence. And China, with other Asian and African countries at the Bandung Conference, laid the basis for South-South cooperation and indeed an entirely new type of international relations based on the equality of nations. By 1979, China's situation had changed dramatically. It now had a certain level of overall industrialization and the basics to feed and clothe the population. Meanwhile, rapprochement with the United States presented new opportunities. And this time it was Deng Xiaoping that dared to turn China around. Reform and opening up has seen hundreds of millions of people leave the countryside to work in the cities. Rural population has fallen from 80% to less than 40% of the total now. And such a massive restructuring has meant the party adopting a top-down approach to build the cities, build the housing, provide the services, the schools, the hospitals, and so on, whilst freeing the private sector and inviting foreign investment to help create employment. The ranks of the Chinese working class has swelled enormously. And just as the private sector has grown, the state-owned sector has grown also, the government careful to ensure that the balance is in favor of the latter. Following years of double digit growth, more recently, the emphasis has shifted to considerations of the environment, health, consumption, innovation, and so on. And the countryside has not been neglected uh, as Rob was describing earlier with the provision of services, water, electricity, internet connections, as well as a system of cooperative health insurance. China became the workshop of the world and just how important it was to the global economy became evident in 2008 when it was China's massive injection of funds for infrastructure that effectively prevented the world financial crisis from becoming a prolonged global depression. China is now a more important trading partner than the US for two thirds of the world. And as it entered onto the world stage, China made suggestions to reform the existing international institutions, such as the IMF, the World Trade Organization and the UN. These proposals being resisted, China has gone ahead to form alternative institutions, the AIIB, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the BRICS Bank and so on, driving forward the multipolar trend. There is still a long way to go to continue to improve the conditions of hundreds of millions of rural migrants who still have a, a hard life. To escape the middle income trap where exports are no longer competitive, either at the low or the high end. To upgrade the technological base, reaching new frontiers, and all of this now under an all out onslaught from the US new Cold War. Yet the party has set ambitious targets for the next 15 years to double the average per capita income, to become a, a global leader in innovation and to turn carbon emissions towards decline. Within 10 years, the Chinese economy will overtake the US. In another 10 years, it may be more than double. What this will mean for the world is hard to imagine. It is sobering to think that from the founding commitment of the Chinese Communist Party to ease the burdens of the Chinese people, it has taken a hundred years to eliminate extreme poverty. Really, that is how hard the going is. But if it becomes easier for other countries to follow as multipolarity gains in strength and momentum, not least through the Belt and Road Initiative, this will surely be China's greatest achievement. By 2049, China aims to become a modern socialist country and a global leader. Looking ahead to these goals, Xi Jinping has called to mind China's revolutionary history and its long march. And he has also introduced a word, a word of caution, noting recently that an important reason for the collapse of the Soviet Union was that the Communist Party became detached from the people uh, and turned into a privileged bureaucratic group that only defended its own interests. Over its hundred year history, the Chinese Communist Party has demonstrated extraordinary flexibility and creativity. During the revolutionary period in particular, the party honed its democratic practices, practices of democratic centralism and the mass line, 
learning from past mistakes, criticism and self-criticism, opening the door of the party to evaluate performance, working from top down and bottom up, handling antagonistic contradictions by non-antagonistic methods. It is by keeping to these practices that the party will continue to lead the Chinese people to prosperity and the world finally, eventually, to peace. Thank you.